Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Welcome to Chai with uh, the greatest researchers, CTDS Dot Show. In this episode, I interview Dr. David Luke, who's the VP of Graphics Research at NVIDIA. David helped found NVIDIA Research in 2006 and has been doing amazing research since at NVIDIA. In this episode, we talk about the fascinating world of graphics and the research in it, the research that goes on behind the scenes, ray tracing. the promise of it and why is it interesting why is it worth uh, looking at we discuss quite a bit about this followed by nvidia's recent improvement in graphics uh, in gans from their recent paper at neurips titled training gans with limited data we dive into the details of this paper uh, david helps explain why is style gan a major breakthrough what is ada and you can find a link to the paper in the show notes or stay tuned for that part of the conversation nvidia has been doing amazing research that we get to see in the world of graphics in the world of games uh, this conversation really dives into depth into all of that into the depth of all of that so without further ado Here's my interview with Dr. David Lupke. Please enjoy the show. I am honored to be interviewing David Lupke from Nvidia. David, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Happy to be here. So I want to start by talking about your journey. You were uh, interested in computer graphics for quite a long time. How how did you get interested in the world of uh, first? Maybe let's talk about computer graphics and your journey there. Yeah. So uh, so I was actually uh, studying chemistry in college, and I happened to be in the graphics lab, or in, in, there wasn't a graphics lab. I was I was in the lab in a computer lab, you know, typing up a paper because we didn't have computer. Not everybody had our own computers back then, and. Um, They wheeled in this big box while I was there. I was typing up some English paper and uh, and took this incredibly strange computer out of it. It was it was a strange shape. It was a strange color. It was it was. It turned out it was a Silicon Graphics Indigo computer, which was this sort of forty thousand dollar graphics workstation made by SGI. That was for them. That was the low their 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 new entry into the low end uh, market. Um, And you know, some professor in the math department had a kind of an, an, a hobby interest in computer graphics and gotten a small grant to buy this forty thousand dollar machine. And I was in, happened to be in there when they when they wheeled it in, and they started setting it up and running some of these demos. And there were three D buttons flying around and all these all this three D stuff happening on the screen in real time. And I'd never seen anything like it. Um, this would have been ninety one maybe, uh, and uh, I was just totally entranced. And and you know, I I I. I found the professor. Uh, turned out he taught a computer graphics class, you know, periodically. He was going to teach the next semester. I kind of lied my way into that class. He said, "Oh well, you don't really need the the you know the computer science classes. You just need to know how to program in Pascal." And I said, "I know how to program in Pascal." <laughs> and then I like went home and learned over winter break, like learned enough Pascal to do it. But but I just I got completely entranced by by that opportunity and by the vision of virtual reality, which I hadn't really heard of until then. It kind of was sort of emerging in popular culture. And that that concept really really drew me in. So, so I switched gears. It was it was late in my it was it was I finished my chemistry major, but you know that late in my senior year I decided I wanted to do uh, computer graphics instead. And so I I didn't have any computer you know exactly one computer science class to my name. It was that computer graphics class that I'd lied my way into, and um, you know by by uh, luck and perhaps a little persistence. Uh, I got into the University of North Carolina for graduate school, and at the time, UNC was and still is one of the leading schools in computer graphics. And 
Um, and that was, that was the start of everything. Um, while I was there, I discovered that um, the part of graphics that I really enjoyed was the geometric part, the, uh, the sort of the, the, the intersection of 3D geometry and algorithms and math was the part that I actually really enjoyed and was kind of good at. And so, so that became my focus. And I sort of wandered away from, you know, the vision of virtual reality, computer games, these things had gotten me interested in, and, simply, um, and, and simply got interested in the actual, like, how do you make pictures on a screen, the actual problem of rendering. And uh, so that, that, that was how I got into computer graphics. And then, you know, from there, it was sort of another left turn several years later that got me into sort of general purpose parallel computing, which in turn turned into deep learning. I, I have another question. Uh, you did teach later on in life a few courses and there was one that, that picked my eye which says real-time rendering and ray tracing, uh, some, something along those lines. Why did it take two decades for us to have Cyberpunk uh, which releases tomorrow at the time of recording? So, um, ray tracing, there's, a, there's some great quotes around this. Um, Turner Witt had invented ray tracing or it's used, you know, it's used for computer graphics back in like 1979, 1980. And somebody asked him when he first presented at the conference, somebody said, what would it take to make this, this real time? You know, you've, you've solved all these problems. You've got reflections and refractions and curved shadows. It looks great. The images look amazing. What would it take to do this in real time? And his answer was, well, you know, uh, you know screens that day were maybe 512 by 512. So uh, you, you go to the desert and you put a bunch of uh, supercomputers down. You know, I don't know if that was a Vax or a Cray at the time, but you put a bunch of supercomputers down, a 512 by 512 grid, and you put a red, green, and blue light bulb on top of each one. And then you fly over to 10,000 feet and you have each computer compute a single ray, and then you can do it fast enough to do it in real time. And, um, and that joke, he sort of updated the computer in it, but that joke, you know, he kept telling it, you know, and, and 15, 20 years later, he was telling that joke. Um, and it's kind of what happened, in fact. Mm. Like, so... What made ray tracing feasible, and we were we were realizing this as an industry uh, in the 2000s, was the advance of just raw computational horsepower um, just marched on and marched on, and and we got clever a little more clever about the algorithms in that very first paper. We we figured out how to do things hierarchically and adaptively, but but fundamentally, it was it, the problem with ray tracing has always been it was just too slow, and the thing that made it possible was computers finally got fast enough, and that's. That brought it in reach. And so when I first joined NVIDIA in NVIDIA research in 2006, we sort of sat around and looked at each other and said, what should we do? And um, my boss at the time, David Kirk, who was a famous guy in computer graphics, um, started, uh, you know, did a lot of really groundbreaking work in ray tracing back, back in his day. Um, he had another quote about ray tracing. He said, ray tracing is the rendering technology of the future and it always will be because it's, it's, it's so obviously the right way to do things, but it's so slow. And so, you know, in 2006, David had hired me and a couple of other people to start NVIDIA research, but he didn't tell us what to do. We, you know, and, and we sat around and said, what, what could we do that would change the game for NVIDIA? And we felt like we should devote ourselves, at least start off the project to, uh, you know, either making ray tracing good on GPUs or making GPUs good for ray tracing. And in the end, it took years, but we, we, we did both. Uh, Step one was doing the software and the algorithms. And that actually turned into a big market for NVIDIA. So that, out of that, um, uh, Steve Parker and Pete Shirley, we hired their small uh, University of Utah spinoff. They were two of the leading researchers. They had a little spinoff. We bought the spinoff. Those people and their, their you know, top students came and that became the core of what's called optics, which is sort of the underlying technology behind DirectX ray tracing and all these other uh, ways that ray tracing has hit the market now. And um, uh, and so within a couple of years, we had an actual, we'd, we'd created a new market for NVIDIA, but it was, it was high end, right? It was the film production. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't something that would run in video games. Uh, it was simply, it was, even though we had gotten, you know, a hundred times faster, it was still too slow. And so in 2000, I think it was 13, we, and this was David Kirk again said, you know, I think we need to make ray tracing a hundred times faster again. And, mm -hmm. and so that became this moonshot. And that's what led to the hardware effort, the effort to actually build dedicated fixed function silicon, something that had been tried and talked about many times in academia, kind of fooled with industrial research labs, but nobody had really bitten the bullet and said, let's go do this for real. What would it take to make ray tracing 100 times faster? And that was our stated goal. So it was Kepler at the time was the chip and we, the NVIDIA uh, family of, of architectures, and we wanted to make ray tracing 100 times faster than that. And we actually delivered, we got with, it was around 99.6 or 99, something like that. It was, it was very close to 100X when it first shipped on Turing. And it's just gotten faster and faster since. Ampere is much faster yet. Um, so it really took, it takes a long time to build a chip, you know, 
It took a long time to figure out the algorithms before that, um, and then to adapt the algorithms for hardware instead of software. So it, it's, um, it, it took so long to make ray tracing happen because it's so obviously the right thing to do, but it's just been so computationally intense that we needed the computers to catch up and then we needed this special fixed function hardware to uh, take that final sort of 100x leap. Absolutely. Just wanted to point out the fact that uh, I also discovered your YouTube channel where you have a video from very early in the days on SIGGRAPH, I think, where you were showing how to do ray tracing in 60 FPS and the video was okay to, to be nice. Over these years, has there been any development in graphics, broadly speaking, that has completely blown you away? Uh, is, it, is it ray tracing or anything otherwise? I am blown away by what we can do with ray tracing now. Um, and... I think there's there's some work at um, you know within Nvidia research that is starting to now hit hit game game developers and game studios that will you know you'll see in, in upcoming games where really ray tracing was always a step right it was a step toward a whole new family of new um, of, of of new light transport algorithms right ray tracing is sort of the the building block that you build light transport algorithms out of and um, the you know, the, the one that everybody uses in practice in, in film, for example, is uh, path tracing, which sounds similar, but, it, you know, it's just, you know, instead of tracing a single ray at a time, you, you, you stitch them together into paths, and there's sort of rules about how you, how you assemble those paths and which paths you take and what direction you go when, you know, when you add a ray to a path. And path tracing is the real thing. It's kind of the holy grail. It's the thing that we wanted to get to with ray tracing. And that's where we're, um, um, that's where we're now uh, really able to start to tackle. So uh, I, I'm blown away by the visual quality that we're achieving, the complexity. The the um the best example of that that's shipped recently is the uh, Nvidia uh, Marbles at Night demo that Jensen showed in a recent keynote. Um, so Marbles at Night, Marbles is the original Marbles demo was amazing and blew me away, but Marbles at Night looks immensely better, and and it's because we're able to have an enormous number of light sources, an enormous complexity of uh, materials and, ge and geometry in that scene. I think that really gives you a glimpse as to what the future of games will look like. Um, you know, uh, when you get path tracing just right, when you get the way that light bounces around a scene just right, then um, it has this kind of delicious creamy look, you know, that, that just looks real. It's so compelling. And that's, that's why it's just universally used um, in film now. It's also because it's real. And therefore the artists, it kind of keeps artists on the manifold of reality. Um, and so it makes their job much, much easier. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, so the, there's really two answers to your question. You asked if there's something that's really blown me away. I think where we've gotten with ray tracing blows me away. And that's, um, that's amazing. The other thing was, is, is actually, to, so pulling it back to um, uh, AI and, and deep learning is the uh, realism that we're achieving now with uh, neural networks like StyleGAN. Uh, the, the quality of those images and the flexibility of them blows me away. And I, I would say that the, the thing that kind of sent shivers down my spine the first time I saw it was um, not the, the human faces, which are very realistic, or the cats or the dogs, which are very realistic. It was uh, the first time they showed me, um, the team showed me demos of cars. Um, Car, like when they train the data on like, you know, ImageNet cars or LSUN cars, mm -hmm. one, of these, one of these big image data sets with, you know, you know tens and tens and tens of thousands of, of pictures of cars. And they're cars from all different settings, right? Some of them are, you know, in a parking lot. Some of them are like marketing images. But, but what, this, what StyleGAN learned by studying all these pictures of cars is when you started sort of changing the dials and kind of moving the latent point around that you were visualizing and looking at the car that that sort of generated, you would get these smooth movements of the car. You'd look at it from, you would sort of move from angle. And, you know, along the way, the trunk would turn to the front and the, you know, the, the, the windows would multiply, you know, but, but it wasn't at all disentangled. But, but just the fact that cars and bedrooms, uh, we saw that the, 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 the network had learned the basic rules of rotation and perspective. It was like a Renaissance artist, you know, like sort of sudden, sort of realizing and studying and figuring out the rules of perspective simply by looking. And that's kind of what the network had done. And that blew me away because um, no matrices were harmed, you know, no rays were cast in the production of those images, right? We didn't do rotation matrices or transformation. We simply looked at a lot of images and derived the rules of 
you know, rotation and perspective and so forth. And that's, um, that's amazing and mind blowing. The machine learning community on Twitter, uh, I think looks down upon TikTok, but we would watch those GIFs of animation of those rotation endlessly. We'll retweet them. We'll like them endlessly every time we see them on Twitter. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really visually very compelling. And, and if you're a graphics person, it's kind of visceral too. It's like, wait, why did I, why have I done all this work? Why have I done all this math? Why did I take all those classes and do all that <laughs> linear algebra in order to like, if, if some network's just going to like figure it out, you know? So, it, so, so that, that implies that there's really, really powerful tools at this intersection of AI and graphics. And that's, that's I think, the thing that I'm most excited about in my professional life right now is, is how do we how do we rethink computer graphics in the face of AI? And does AI have machine learning have something to learn from uh, computer graphics? And I think the answer to that is yes as well. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things we've learned in graphics that are that are now finding their way back into machine learning and computer vision and all those other applications. So we'll just talk about your research work, but first. Uh want to point out that I had a chance to interview Brian, who suggested playing Dead Standing for DLSS. There's this very fascinating depth in uh, ray tracing. It's it's hard to describe. I mean, I have a 3090, so might as well try a game. But uh, it's it's a different level of immersion. I ended up playing 20 hours straight. Uh, what's, what's the big picture for ray tracing? Uh, does it add in depth for VR or AR in the future? Why, why is it so important for NVIDIA? And why is, why is there so much focus on it? Ray tracing fundamentally lends itself better to, um, I, I've got many different answers to that question. Ray tracing fundamentally limits itself better to simulating reality. But, you know, in computer graphics, simulating reality means simulating the way that light bounces around and off of the surfaces in a scene. Sometimes you have light bouncing into surfaces like skin is slightly translucent, you know, wax, milk, you know, there's all these materials that are actually slightly translucent, car paint, you know, and and you simulate the way the light goes into there and bounces around and comes out somewhere else. Um, fundamentally, that was hard. You could fake a lot of those effects and you could fake them fairly convincingly um, with rasterization, which is you know, how GPUs have always worked, how graphics has always worked. Um, but uh, all of those fakes kind of make incompatible assumptions. And once you start stacking them on top of each other, you get this really fragile sort of house of cards. And you know you can fix the shadow. You can make the shadows look better, but in the process, you know you no longer get the subsurface scattering of the skin. Or there's just all these different examples of, uh, you know, fundamentally with with ray tracing and in particular techniques like path tracing that are built on top of it, uh, you can simulate reality, and so you you will get just more atmospheric, more realistic. Um, effects. You will just get deeper effects. Thing, the way that light, very subtle things, the way that light bounces off of a surface, you know, at a distance, you know, at, at a grazing angle, a little bit differently than it does at other, at, you know, when you look at it, at, uh, you know, head on the way that, you know, if you have something that's red, if I'm wearing a green shirt, there's just a little bit of green tinge to me and it's almost imperceptible, but it's, but it's there. And, and if I, you know, if, if something else moves into the scene, you'll, you'll see it by the reflection off of my skin, even before it's, if it's off camera, it, these things are so subtle and nuanced that it's very hard to even consciously notice them, but they're very, um, but I think that's what takes you that final mile kind of the final bridge over the uncanny Valley, you know, is, is, is that those, those very, very subtle effects in the way that light um, bounces around a scene. I think that's why ray tracing is so important. VR and AR, um, you know, there's of course ray tracing fundamentally scales with the number of pixels you have instead of the number of, um, sort of the complexity of the scene, right? It's, it's a, you know, famously, it's sort of sublinear in the complexity of the scene because you build, you build a big, you know, hierarchical structure over all the polygons in the scene and, and you, 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 know, you don't have to, you have sort of logarithmic work to, to exam to find a particular polygon, but you're casting a ray for every pixel. Mm -hmm. and, and so now if you have a 4K screen or an 8K screen, then you gotta cast a lot more rays. Um, that is, there's, so there's two things that are worth noting there. One is like, that's, that's why ray tracing in VR is gonna lag a little behind, uh, but there's all kinds of other reasons why you'd like to use ray tracing in VR. You know, a simple one is, you know, because of the lenses and stuff, the, the, uh, the pixels are not a simple re rectilinear grid in front of you. Um, they're actually sort of warped. And right now we kind of unwarp them in rasterization. That's kind of just another one of these complex hacks that doesn't necessarily stack well with all of the other things 
that you'd like to do. And so I think that both for just the sheer realism that it brings to a scene and for a bunch of more technical things having to do with like how the displays actually work and the interaction of displays and optics and the human eye, there's a lot of advantages to doing ray tracing. So I do think that VR will move to ray tracing just like I think everything else will move to ray tracing you know, in the fullness of time. The other thing I wanna say is that it that the way that it scales with pixels is exactly why techniques like DLSS, you know, since he spoke to Brian, DLSS are so important, right? DLSS gives us this kind of uh, escape hatch that, that lets, us, um, lets us render and drive screens at much higher resolution than, than we, you know, without waiting for the next, you know, another generation of GPUs. Like we, we sort of gives us a generational leap um, for free. And, and that's, that's incredibly powerful. And, and DLSS and related technologies like denoising, you know, uh, are, are gonna be really important uses of uh, you know, machine learning in the graphics process. And a good example of what I talked about to, to anyone who's been able to experience this, just, just turning up your graphic settings to maximum in a game that supports it, uh, being able to see your reflection in a puddle of water somewhere around the game. These little details, they add a very interesting level of immersion, like you said. Yeah. And I think it's only going to get better. I think that games today are just starting to come out that have really like embraced ray tracing from the get-go, from during the art pipeline. So... Um, the first generation of games that looked great, but it was it was largely kind of gimmicks, you know. Like, um, but but as as you know, the consoles start to support ray tracing as as you know, Nvidia GPUs come out as competitors GPUs advance. Like, we're we're really the reason why it was so important for us to do ray tracing was that it redefined the playing field, right? It opened a whole new playing field, a whole new game, you know, and and the whole industry now you know gets to learn the rules of that new game and to get better at it. But it gives us all you know, uh, more runway for more realism, you know, more, you know, more places to go and, you know, makes the problem harder again. And that's actually a good thing for all of us. Totally. I could, I could talk about games oddly. I'm a, I'm a big gamer <laughs> if, if, if it's not apparent <laughs> yeah, at yeah. this point, <laughs> uh, but would like, would really love to dive into research. Now you founded, uh, the graphics research group in 2006. What was the vision? Uh, then you, you've given us a small hint, but, uh, what was the vision then? How has it evolved over all of these yeah. years? Yeah. Yeah. So, Okay, so so like I said, I was not the boss. I was I was I happened by a week of, by a quirk of timing. I happened to be the first to get hired to actually start. Um, so I can claim to be the longest standing uh, Nvidia researcher. My <laughs> boss David Kirk uh, retired a, a couple years ago, um, and uh, so I've been here since uh, since early two thousand six, or I guess mid two thousand six, and and at the time it wasn't a graphics research group. It was it was it was an, it was a research group. You know, Nvidia was much much smaller, maybe two thousand people. Uh, and, and so we were, we were a correspondingly small group uh, chartered with the goal of doing long-term research that would have impact to the company. And that's, that's never changed. Um, so my current boss, who, who, um, who David Kirk helped hire, you know, you know years ago, 2008 or nine, uh, is Bill Daly. And he, he, has a, he has a great way of putting it. You know, uh, he says, we, we are the high beams of the company. Our job is to look further down the road than you know, anybody else in the company and to do things that are outside of the, risk hori- the time horizon or the risk horizon of the product groups and the engineering groups, okay? So it's not, uh, you know, we're not an academic uh, department, right? We're not doing research for the sheer joy of publishing papers and you know cite, you know citing authorities and using jargon right you know that's uh, <laughs> that's not actually the point the point is to like uh, is to you know do great work for the company and uh, and we are a very small fraction of the company so it would be a, a waste of of our time uh, and the company's sort of resources to do work that the engineering groups can already do and can often do better and you know, better poised to do They're, you know so so. So we try very hard to do work that is outside of either the time horizon or the risk horizon of those research of those uh, product and engineering groups, but that is absolutely important to them. And so that's the balance you have to you have to, to to walk. It's it's easy to do work that is important to the company. You hire really good people and you go to the VP of you know GPU or the VP of software and you say, what are your big problems and you know what do you want us to do? And we go in and they say, I need help on this GPU. I need help on this unit. You know, and, and you go and do that. 
It's also actually easy to do good research. You hire really smart people and you, you say, go publish papers, you know, go publish papers in the top conferences and you'll get good research out of that. But to do good research that impacts the company is a very tough line to walk. And, and it's, but it, that is the sport of industrial research. Industrial research done well is exactly that. It's, it's a, um, your, your goal is to do work that is gonna make a big difference to the company. Uh, and it's okay if it takes a long time before that will reach fruition. Um, uh, because of this focus on you know, high risk, high reward research, um, it's really important that we, uh, that we fail fast. Right, so, so again, my boss, Bill Daly, has a great quote about this. I use it every time I can. He says, don't think of your research ideas as your children. Think of them as your livestock, right? They're very important, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they're worth a lot, but you don't get attached to them. Don't, don't you know, your children, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna stand with them throughout. You're gonna, you're gonna love them and can see them off into the, you know, you can do whatever it takes to help them succeed. And actually like your research ideas, you shouldn't be like that, right? You know, many of your research ideas are bad or are good, but a sort of, disconnected with what will actually help the company or what will actually move the field forward. So, um, so, so be, be, be ruthless and try to fail fast on your research ideas. So I think, I think those, that gives you a sense of the philosophy of NVIDIA research and all of that has stayed true. I think, you know, David Kirk established that, Bill Daly crystallized that. And, you know, I try to promote that, you know, every chance I get with my team. In those early days, there were, you know, three of us at first and then gradually a few more, um, a handful of interns. Uh, and, you know, Brian Catanzaro was one of those first interns. Um, and, and so we sat around and said, what are some important things we could do? And what was brand new then was CUDA. So the idea of using GPUs for general purpose computation was still, was not new, but it was very uh, risque, right? Very few people were really seriously doing work in that. I was one of those people as an academic at the University of Virginia before I came to NVIDIA. Um, Ian Buck, who invented CUDA and, and, you know, he was one of those people. Uh, working with Bill Daly, among others, at Stanford. So there are a handful of people in the world doing serious research on how to use GPUs. But, but actually, NVIDIA had embraced this idea. I didn't even know this at the time in 2006. I suspected something might be going on. But when I got there, they showed me the manuals for CUDA, which had almost been, which was not quite ready, not quite released. But, um, and uh, they'd really embraced this idea of doing general purpose computation. But it was still a brand new idea, very untested, how to program in CUDA, even in video, we weren't, we didn't necessarily know the right ways to do it. Certainly the real world didn't do that. And so we did, we focused on basically two things in those early years. We focused on ray tracing or sort of, you know, redefining visuals, redefining, you know, the visual computing. And we focused on um, parallel processing, parallel programming models. You know, what are the, what is the right, how do you do programming systems and applications? you know, not just CUDA and not just compilers, but also tools and debugging. What are the basic algorithms, the algorithmic building blocks of the massively parallel data, data parallel computing that GPUs, um, you know, uh, epitomize. So that's, those were the two things that we focused on. And that kind of gradually crystallized into, into groups. And so after a year or so, I became a manager of the graphics of, of well, it wasn't even quite the graphics group, but I became a manager of what became the graphics group. Um, okay. And, um, uh, and, you know, over time, uh, my colleague, Michael Gar Garland, who started a week after me, and so was really one of these, these you know, he and I were sort of two of the, the main founders, he ended up starting the programming systems and applications group and, and still runs that, that, uh, that Brian worked with in those early days. So that gives you a, a flavor of what it was like. Small company, research was a dirty word, right? You know, like research <laughs> was what people did who weren't serious about getting something done. Uh, and, and so it, it was... Um, you know, the company culture was a little distrustful of research because your know, research had this, I think, somewhat deserved reputation of, of navel gazing, right? You know, being, you know, being kind of, you know, doing something that was interesting but irrelevant, or doing something that was toy prop tackling toy problems. And so we 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 had to work hard over time to like, you know, prove that we were doing relevant, interesting, important work. And and you know, we've had many, many successes over the years from CUDNN to uh, to optics and ray tracing hardware to DLSS. Um, when Bill Daly came, he expanded the charter considerably. And so we have architecture research groups, an architecture research group, and a circuits research group, and a networking research group, and, and you know, many, many other, and now, of course, many AI and computer vision, you know, uh, groups. So, so the research now is a very broad enterprise, 
it's around 200 people across the, and, and we're kind of scattered across the globe, or at least most, mostly on the Western Hemisphere at the moment. Um, but but we're, we're scattered all over and uh, graphics research, which I run is about 45 people, you know, that's mostly in Europe and the US. Okay. Uh, NVIDIA is a future facing company. It's a technology company. And you, uh, like you said, it's a high risk, uh, high reward research that is an investment into company. You're always looking at future, fa- uh, future facing ideas in a day to day basis. What does a day in your life look like? How, how are you finding these ideas? Is, is it a constant introspection or is it always a fixed goal followed by another? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> so I, ideas are easy to come by. The hard part is finding the right ones and, and, <laughs> and, you know, and failing fast. Uh, on the ones that you're not sure if they're right or not. Uh, so uh, what is a day? So, so, you know, my day is probably not very typical of NVIDIA researchers because, because, because you know, my day is, has a lot of management uh, and a lot of administration. But I, I, try to, I try to keep a hand in at least one technical thing at a time. And I try, to, I try to be like actually like thinking at least at a whiteboard kind of level about the technical things, you know, one thing at a time. And so over the years, that's been ray tracing, that's been um, AR, VR, and especially sort of the computational display aspect of AR, VR, something we've spent a lot of, uh, we've spent a lot of time on in NVIDIA research. These days, it's kind of neural image synthesis, right? The actual, um, you, know, you know, topics like using StyleGAN or, or, or other, um, other, you know, architectures to, to sort of directly generate imagery and how do you generalize that to a com- something that is a useful computer graphics pipeline. <coughs> So my day has a ton of meetings and I'd say about half of them are technical, you know, focusing on one of these things or the other, or they're like one-on-one meetings with my various, <clears throat> my various reports, you know, where we mostly talk about, you know, these technical things, ray tracing, light transport, um, uh, uh, hyperscale graphics and sort of data center, you know, sort of data, sc- hyperscale is, is sort of a cool trendy name for a data center, right? But um, a data center sounds very like mundane and pedestrian, right? You no know, hyperscale <laughs> graphics, but that's actually super interesting. What is the future, you know, what does graphics look like when you really reimagine it for, for a world, sort of a cloud first world? You know, I don't think it's the, the current streaming services are a great start first step, but fundamentally you're renting a piece of a GPU in the world, in the, in the, um, in the cloud and you're, and you're, you're playing, you know, playing a fraction of a GPU at a time. And that doesn't scale great. What you'd really like is hundred GPUs in the cloud and supporting 10,000 people playing a game, you know, or, or, ex, you know, participating in some, you know, uh, you know, some, some uh, shared experience. And I think, I think that's going to be very interesting. So Back to your question about what does a day look like? You know, I send a lot of email, I sit in a lot of meetings and I try, I try along the way to spend some of that time, you know, not just on marketing or administration or, or, um, or PR, but, but actually like, you know, half my time, I'd like to be sort of, you know, focused on technical problems one way or another, even if that's mostly sort of living vicariously through the, you know, the 45 brilliant people who work for me. <laughs> okay. I'll use that to transition into the topic of uh, the paper that I'd really love to dive into. It's titled Training uh, GANs with Limited Data. It's from NeurIPS this year. Uh, for the uninitiated, if you could please help us understand, uh, I, I assume everyone uh, from the audience understand what a GAN is, but uh, wh- why is style GAN such a huge improvement? Uh, I'm sure people have seen the outputs, but w- what's the uh, little secret there? Uh, so, well, so GANs, just as a review, Right, again, is two, two networks, a, a generator and a discriminator. And I'll make a point about those networks that, that I, don't, I don't hear often enough. Um, the generator is, uh, you know, as, as we know, the generator is the network you want. That's the thing that is going to make a picture or perhaps, you know, a, an audio file or something, right? You know, but in our case, it's, it's an image. And the generator is going to take some, some input. In our case, it's usually just, a, you know, a random latent vector, a, a bunch of numbers, and generate a picture. And you change the numbers and you get a different picture. Uh, that's what you want. The discriminator, of course, its job is to uh, decide whether that that image is real or not real. And that's how it's always portrayed, right? You train the discriminator by showing it a bunch of real images and you label them real. You say, okay, these have a realism score of one. And then you showed a bunch of generated images that came from the generator and you know they're synthetic because they came from the generator and you say, these have a realism score of zero. And then you train this, this, this discriminator um, you know, to either classify as a classifier, or better still as sort of a regressor to, to, to sort of assign a realism score to every image. 
And so that's how it's often, people often stop there when they're explaining GANs. But, um, but that, that, that focuses too much on the adversarial part of the generative adversarial network um, because uh, the, the analogy you often get is, is a, you know, a criminal and a cop, you know, an art forger and an art detective, you know, um, but what, what that misses is that the whole point of the generator is actually not to get really good at discriminating whether this is a real image or a fake image. Um, generators are, I mean, discriminators are surprisingly bad at that. Um, you would think, for example, that a, a generator, I mean, a discriminator trained on with StyleGAN to generate, you know, pictures of faces or cats, you know, could detect, could be a cat detector. Mm -hmm. No, not at all, right? It's terrible at that. Um, because it has what it is, it is co-evolved with a generator to look at sort of like very specific nuances of whatever the generator was not doing as well at the time. So um, really the goal of the generator is not to distinguish real and you know, synthetic images, it's to coach the generator into making better synthetic images. And so it's more of a coach. So, so the example that, um, that, that, uh, that we like to use is sort of an athlete and a coach model, right? Uh, maybe the coach is only a little bit better than the athlete, but they're, they're, they're good enough that they can keep the athlete, you know, you know, improving. They can always give feedback for how to improve. That's the goal of the discriminator. And so GANs are a generator and a discriminator. They're not really adversaries. They're not an art forger or an art detective. They're an athlete and a coach. Now, um, the discriminator uh, style GAN, the, the advance is really all about the generator, right? And it's, it's a new approach to it was a new approach when we first came out with it to, to making images out of a series of random numbers uh, that, that drew on this literature called style transfer, right? And style transfer, we've all seen, right? You take a picture, you take a photograph and you make it look like a painting by Van Gogh, you know, or, you know, or, 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 or something like that, right? You take, the, you take a, a style image, which maybe is your painting by Van Gogh or Picasso or Monet or whatever, and you, um, and you, you evolve the, generator to, uh, the, the, sorry, you, you evolve the target image to, to look like that, to have that style. So really what's going on there, if you look at the style transfer literature, what they're doing is they're taking a, an image and they're passing it through the first few layers of some highly trained network, VGG or something else, right? And those first few layers, you take some network, say, as a that's been trained as a classifier, but it's been, it's been trained on zillions of images, all, a, a wide variety of images. What that network does is it gets good at recognizing um, the, the early levels of that network evolved to something kind of approximating what happens in our, in our brains and in our retinas, right? You, you get kind of edge detectors and corner detectors and eventually shape detectors. And as you get sort of deeper down the network, the, the sort of all of the weights of all of the, net, all of the, all of the neurons, um, you know, take on this attribute where they're kind of detecting low level and mid level image features. Um, and we've known that for a while and it was sort of a cur an interesting curiosity. Um, but what the style transfer literature really kind of recognizes is that we can, we can use that, that characteristic of these, this, this network. Uh, we can throw away the actual classification. We don't care if it recognizes a bicycle from a cat. Um, we're just gonna use the sort of top part of that network, the first few layers of that network which kind of have this, this attribute that they, they, uh, they, they represent, they, they end up encoding these low level image features. So then you take your style image, your painting of Van Gogh, and you pass it into this network and you look at the activations that you get, right? All of these convolutions with all these different sets of weights that you've learned in the process of learning bicycles and cats. Um, you're now just using them and you're looking at their activation. And what you do is you kind of, you take a statistical fingerprint uh, you take all the statistics of all of those different activation layers and you get a fingerprint, a statistical fingerprint that kind of tells you what a Van Gogh represents, what a Van Gogh image looks like. Um, and then you can take your target image that you want to make look like a Van Gogh painting and you stick it in and you just use stochastic gradient descent to kind of move it, you know, use the gradients to sort of adjust it to make it look to, to closer match, more closely match that statistical fingerprint of the Van Gogh image. And you iterate a bunch of times in the SGD way and, and you, you end up with, you know, your picture of, you know, you know your, from your vacation last year, looking like a Van Gogh print. Um, that's a very powerful tool, right? The input looks nothing like the output. It is recognizably the same thing though, but when this other style. And so that's fascinating um, that that works so well. And so the basic insight in style again is let's use this idea of enforcing, of manipulating statistics of activations 
rather, you know, you know, uh, as, as our image generation technique. Ultimately, the statistics we use, there, there have been papers in the style transfer literature that show you can use very simple statistics. And by simple, I mean literally the mean and standard deviation of every activation layer, you know, in this, you know, every, every you know, um, feature map, uh, you know, in, 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 these, um, uh, in, in these networks. Uh, mean and standard deviation, very, very simple, right? And uh, so we, we simply, that's all we do. So the styles in StyleGAN are just a whole bunch of numbers that essentially turn into a desired mean and standard deviation applied to the many different um, feature maps at the, at the first, at the, you know, eight or so layers of the StyleGAN generator. Um, so there's roughly a hundred, you know, activation layers, you know, feature maps per, per layer. There's sort of, you know, more up top and fewer below, but roughly a hundred. And we're just specifying, you know, uh, the, the desired mean and standard deviation of the activations, you know, when we go through there, that is the thing that we tinker with and that we back propagate to. And, and in the end, um, uh, you know, the input to the style, to the to style again is a, you know, is turned into a bunch of means and standard deviations of all these activations. And then you just pass a constant input through it. And what comes out having been manipulated, you know, in this way is a realistic image of a cat or a car at some angle or a human face or a painting. Uh, so that's, that's the key insight behind style again, is to draw on this um, style transfer literature for inspiration for the actual image generation architecture. Uh, GANs are an entire world in itself. I had a chance to interview Ian Goodfellow who said he himself doesn't keep up with what GANs are going out there. But for anyone who's, I, I, it's uh, the research of course is very interesting if anyone dives into it, but just appreciating the output from StyleGAN followed by StyleGAN V2 and now the recent paper up. Uh, visually, you can see the difference. You can really appreciate the differences by looking at them also. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of, there's an amazing amount of work right now. I think StyleGAN 2 is still sort of the, the gold standard in terms of, of realism uh, for the kinds of images where it's, you know, well-suited and, um, and a lot of people are building on it. So, you know, that, that, that won't stay true. You know, there's, there's, there's many things that one can do to improve it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll probably do a couple of them, but, you know, the world in general will do many of those things. So it, it's, it's a, I think it was sort of a watershed because it was the first time you got really high, you know, high resolution images that really looked good almost all the time. You know, just uncurated images from StyleGAN, if you have enough training, to look quite good. Uh, you know, not perfect, but, but quite good. Um, and that's maybe a segue into the ADA paper that's coming out at NeurIPS, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, still this, the same StyleGAN generator, but now with a, um, a different training protocol. Uh, and so the real problem with, with GANs and style GANs, they're a very powerful tool as we can see, but you need so much data to train them. So we curated a database of you know, 70,000 images um, or 140,000 images you know, to, to make some of the pictures that we've made with style GAN. And uh, it looks great, but you know, there's, there's many kinds of data that many kinds of images you'd like to generate where there's, you simply, there, those images don't exist, right? There's <laughs> unlimited cats on the internet, right? I can, I can train something to make realistic cats with, with very little effort, right? I can easily go get a million images of cats, but you know, there's not that many images of a particular kind of tumor or a particular kind of skin cancer, you know, that you might get on your, on your hand or of a, um, or, or, you know, there might be many kinds of many images of skin cancer, but, you know, there's privacy laws that, you know, rightfully protect them. And you can't simply, you know, collect, you know, all of these images and ship them around, right? You know, there's, there's very strong privacy laws that, that are, that are in place around medical data and increasingly around all kinds of data. And I, I think that's actually a very good thing. Um, so, you know, there, that's another reason why you might simply not have easy access or perhaps any access to, you know, tens and tens of thousands of images to train on. And so that's where, um, that's where we sort of put our attention to after, after StyleGAN2, we, we, we wanted to really tackle this question of like, you know, how much training data do you need? And how do you know how much you need? And how much, how do you know when you're, when you've got enough or when you don't have enough? Um, and that's fundamentally what's in this new NeurIPS paper about training generative adversarial networks with limited data. Uh, the technique in there is called ADA, stands for Adaptive Discriminator Augmentation. And 
really what we're doing is is something that that's that's fairly obvious in the sense that um, uh, you know the com the computer vision and you know object recognition communities you know, use it as a, as a standard tool. We're doing image augmentation. We take our our training data and maybe you only have you know three thousand images instead of thirty thousand images or three hundred thousand images. So you take those three thousand images and you augment them. That means you apply a bunch of random distortions, uh, random perturbations of the image, and there's all kinds of things you can do. You can shift them, you can rotate them, you can recolor them, um, you can take pixels out of them, you can zoom them. And, um, and of course you'd like to do all these in a differentiable fashion. Um, uh, uh, and, and so once you've got this big collection of, of image augmentations, then now you can actually do them on the fly. Like you don't have to, you don't have to like pre-process your 3000 images and turn them into 300,000 images and then read them in again. You can just sort of read in those 3,000 images and you know, and apply one of the augmentations or more of more than one of the augmentations in your sort of list. The reason why this hadn't been done before successfully was that the, the problem of uh, leakage, meaning like if I start showing the discriminator a, a bunch of a bunch of images that have been rotated, you know, it's going to think that images that images of humans can be rotated and that an image of a human, you know, on its side is, or upside down is equally likely to an image of a human like sort of right side up, um, yeah, you know, and, and the same with cats and bicycles and, you know, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so to get around that, uh, you know, was, was kind of the, it was one of the big tricks. Um, fundamentally, it turns out that the problem of uh, the problem with augmentation, the problem, sorry, excuse me, sorry. Fundamentally, it turns out that the problem with, uh, with GANs when you don't have enough data is overfitting of the discriminator, right? So the discriminator, say you only have 3000 images, you've built this powerful discriminator network. Um, it can simply memorize those 3000 images, mm -hmm. right? There's some particular pattern of pixels and you know, just pattern of bits in the pixels. There's a particular sort of set of noise you know, you know, might even be like JPEG dimples, you know, that, that are tip that are, that are in each image and not in any of those other 3000 images. And so it's actually, you know, if, there, if there's a flaw in your data, networks will, will exploit it, will, will find it and exploit it. Right. And so the, the discriminator's job is to learn to tell real images from fake. Well, the best way for it to do that is to memorize all the real images. And at that point, it no longer gives useful feedback to the, to the, to the generator. Right. So, you know, whatever gradients the discriminator is passing back to the generator are just useless. And they end up misleading the generator so badly that the generator sort of spirals out of control. And so this is the classic problem of GANs. GANs are fairly, anybody who's tried knows that GANs are actually fairly hard to train. They're, they tend to be very unstable. You train them and results look good. And then they start to, you know, look kind of all the same and then they start to get worse. Um, and, and, and then they spiral off and you end up with something that looks like, you know, an Andy Warhol painting. It's just, you know, complete garbage. Uh, that, that's an overfitting problem. And again, that suggests the solution. Over, what we do about overfitting in image recognition networks is we augment the incoming images. So it can't simply memorize the images. There's an infinity of them. It's different every time it sees an, every time it sees an image, it's got a new distortion uh, added uh, or a new set of distortions. Um, so we needed two problems. One is we, need, we needed to avoid the distortions leaking into the generated images. And the other is we needed to um, avoid this problem of the discriminator overfitting um, mm -hmm. and sort of spiraling out of control. And here's, here's a key insight. If you apply these distortions probabilistically, it turns out that, that you, this can solve these problems. So, um, the, and this is kind of counterintuitive. The best example I've heard is, imagine that one of your augmentations was to black out every pixel in the image. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not a very useful augmentation, right? But, um, uh, but if you only applied it 90% of the time, then 10% of the time, the discriminator would still see, you know, the correct image, right? And you can imagine that the discriminator could still learn what an image looks like, what an image of a cat or a bicycle looks like, and, you know, develop the, you know, sort of pass on gradients to the generator that will help it, you know, make images of cats or bicycles or whatever. Um, so, simply making these images or these augmentations probabilistic um, actually helps solve the problem. And then it's a question of what probability do you use? So if you only apply a distortion 
if you so if we have like 18 distortions and you apply each of them with a 0.4 percent, you know, 0.4 probability, right? So 40 percent of the time you're going to apply this distortion, then um, then it's uh, uh, that's really heavy augmentations. You know, many of those 18 distortions are going to get applied, and so that image is going to be rotated, recolored, and noised, and you know, reflected. Um, but uh, the fact is that even that's kind of enough. Now, if you have the more the 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 more data that you have, the less you need this augmentation trick. The more overfitting that the discriminator happens to be doing at this moment, the more you need it, right? And so that's the adaptive part. Essentially, what we've done in the paper, without going into any more details, uh, is is figured out a way to guide the, to apply augmentation adaptively to uh, guide the discriminator when it starts to overfit then we apply more augmentation. As, it does, as it's in less risk of overfitting, we apply less augmentation, and that actually can change over time. That, that's, that, that, uh, that's the adaptive discriminator augmentation that's talked about in the paper. Okay. For the audience, it's again uh, titled Training GANs with Limited Data. Look that up or find it in the show notes. Uh, they, there's links to that. Uh, in the paper, it's shown that you've applied these uh, to different categories of images. Have you observed that uh, different augmentations work well for uh, different categories? Is that also counted in this approach? We haven't done a systematic study of that. There's eight, I think we implement, if I remember right, we implement like 18, implement, 18 of these augmentations, you know, sort of from the standard catalog of, of, of augmentations. Um, you know, our goal and... And I think we found, as I recall, we found that they all work. Um, they all they all help, but actually, you get slightly better results if you don't do like four of them. So, like I think, if I'm recalling right, it's like adding noise and doing the cutouts where you just replace a block of pixels with you know, gray or black or something. Those those in it they work, but they're not um, they're not useful, right? You know, in the end, you you do better to use you know the fourteen, you know, a set of fourteen. Now, would that change for different kinds of images? Probably, quite quite possibly. We haven't really done a systematic study of that, to be honest. Okay. Um, we did release the code. It's worth saying for um, not only for the the the, the uh, StyleGAN two eighty a, um, you know, sort of the training protocol per se, but also this. Um, we made it modular so that this set of augmentation, this augmentation pipeline is you know is you know, high quality, well well implemented, fast. Um, uh, augmentation pipe, differentiable augmentation pipeline as a separate module so that people who are interested in exploring this concept but don't want to be wedded to style again to architecture can um, can use that. We, we think that's a useful contribution. Uh, links to that will also be there in the show notes for anyone in the audience. GANs, uh, it's easier to generate creative images. We can just as humans also appreciate them, but how do we uh, get the right uh, let's say images of tumors uh, that aren't just something that the uh, network has just checked out. And we as a non-domain expert can maybe say, okay, it's, maybe it's a tumor. So how do we check that? Yeah, no, th th that's a good question. So the, the use of, you know, GANs are being heavily used or at least heavily studied in the medical, um, you know, in the medical imaging community and, and, and in medicine in general. I think, I think there's a lot, everybody there sees the potential for that. There's a, we cite a, um, we cite a good survey paper in the uh, in the in the in the NeurIPS, in our NeurIPS paper. The um, uh, I, I so I think it does depend a little bit on on you know the domain. It's a little hard. It's hard to speak in generalities. But but here's the way I would look at it. Clearly, if you're going to use GANs to you know generate um, novel images of some particular pathology. So the example that I we we show we show um, some um, breast cancer histopathology uh, data set. Um, that that's you know a standard data set that's out there, a public data set that's that's been released. We show images trained on that to generate you know new images which are you know representative of the images in the data set. Now, you would really need a um, you would definitely need a medical expert to like look over the results of, of the GAN to say yes, is it doing a good job you know representing these different pathologies? Uh, you would need you would you would want to test that carefully. Uh, but I think that that's, that's still a big help. I think that's still a big advance because today, if you wanted to do that, you would need that same medical expert to go in and help you curate this giant corpus of, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of 
breast cancer histopathology slides or particular MR tumor, you know, MRI tumors as imaged by a particular machine or whatever it is that you happen to need. Um, right now, that's a very daunting task simply to gather the data to create the GAN to find out whether this technique is going to be useful at all. Um, you know, if you can instead use that, you know, your limited access to the medical expert, the, the domain expert who, who, who can, you know, analyze the results and give you feedback on like, are you doing something right here? Is this going to be a useful tool? Um, you know, that, that's a much better use of their time than, you know, combing through, uh, you know, piles and piles of data trying to sort of curate this, this enormous corpus that you need. So that, that's where we feel like concretely the ADA protocol will be helpful in many of these applications of GANs to medicine is, is we, they, they kind of, they let, they let the medical experts focus on the more, you know, sort of interesting and important piece of the pipeline, which is evaluating results as opposed to simply like gathering input data. Which is also the promise of AI, if I may broadly speaking, just allowing us to focus on the more important tasks and let the tools do the job. Um, so that that also brings me to the end of uh, the section on uh, the paper. Uh, I have a few general questions now about research. Uh, would love to start by asking you, uh, what's your favorite trend uh, or any aspect of research that has stood out to you uh, in the recent years or, or throughout your Re career? Research in general or graphics or AI or? In general, uh, <laughs> I, I know it's a very broad uh, question, but one thing that really stood out to you. It's a broad question. My favorite papers are all like at least five, if not 10 years old, because like, I think it takes that long for you to decide, you know, how, you know, that for, for, for something to, something has to kind of withstand the test of time. And, um, and, and it's, it's, it's when you look back at a paper 10 years later that you decide, wow, that really was an important breakthrough. That, that, that started a whole new field, you know, in Goodfellow's GAN paper, right? Yes. Yeah, that was lauded at the time. People recognized it as, as a breakthrough, but, but now you would go back and say, wow, no, that, was, that, was, that was one of the breakthroughs, right? That was, that was enormously important, um, not just fairly important. Uh, and so sort of stunning, uh, gosh, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like, no, no, I feel that, 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 that one's, that one's too hard. It's, it's my favorite. I, 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 I'm so excited about so much that I see every year in SIGGRAPH and CVPR and, um, uh, and, and, you know, ICML, like there, there's always something that's just really exciting. I feel like um, I feel like the advances that we're seeing. I'm still fundamentally a graphics guy, right? And like I think that the advances that we're seeing toward um, generating, you know, photorealistic images um, that sort of cross that uncanny valley that let us let us make something that truly, you know, looks and feels real. Um, is, is just really, really exciting. And I feel like we've done our share of that work. You know, we're certainly, there's certainly many, many people doing great work there. Um, so I'd say that's my, uh, that's a very generic answer, but it's hard, it's hard to put a finger on. Like, you know, the only papers I can think of that are like among my favorite papers, they're all like 20 or 50 years old, you yeah. know, because those are the ones that you could really tell, wow, that, 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 was, that was amazing. Okay. Uh Let's say you solve graphics somehow magically. What what would be the next uh, task that you would like to work on, or next field that you would uh, love to re uh, do research in? I think that um, well, <laughs> I I think that you know graphics is a hard problem, and I think vision is the same problem, like sort of squared. You know, right? I mean, I think you know fundamentally understanding the real world. And coupling it, so, so to solve graphics kind of implies that we can now create, you know, fully believable synthetic worlds, and and we can immerse ourselves in them, you know, with you know, VR or other techniques. We we can really like feel like we're inside in a synthetic world. So the next step is to like, you know, but actually I, I like the real world. You know, like I, I enjoy the real world. I, I like to hike and I like to meet people in person when I can. You know, and, and it's a shame that we have to do this over Zoom, right? Instead of you know over <laughs> over a chai. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think that that's why augmented reality is so much more exciting ultimately than virtual reality is because it is 
it is bridging that gap between the real world and the synthetic world. Yes, we are making great strides at rendering synthetic worlds. And there's also still great, you know, grand challenge problems, right? You know, moonshots that we haven't even attempted um, uh, in that space. But, but yes, it's more conceivable to me that I will see that problem kind of solved, you know, in some, in some realistic sense than the next step of like, then understanding the real world well enough to like merge them seamlessly. And I think that that's ultimately, you know, one of the things I would work on next. Okay. Uh, this is a repeat question. Usually my last question, uh, what's your best advice to people who are just starting their research journey, a uh, single best advice? Um, be curious and don't follow the crowd. Like you need to know what everybody is doing. Don't, don't, you, you could you could you could you could be arrogant and assume that like what you're doing is more important than other people that's not that's not the advice the the advice is you know don't do what every don't do the obvious next thing um you know do go don't follow the crowd find 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 something that's that that is um interesting to you but that other people aren't uh aren't already doing uh or aren't already like Epsilon away from and, and go try it. And you'll have to do that many times. You'll have to fail many times because a lot of times nobody's doing it because it's a bad idea or because it doesn't work, you know? Um, so, so don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid uh, uh, to, to try different things. In fact, as I said earlier, don't think of your research ideas as your children, you know, to quote my boss, Bill Daly, think of them as your livestock, think of them as your crops, right? You know, you can, um, you, you, have, you have many ideas, um, most of them are probably bad. Explore them fast, fail fast, and go. Um, and, and and that's your best chance of stumbling upon that idea that is a rich vein that you can mine for years and 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 you know do something really groundbreaking for. So, that's amazing advice. Uh, this question sometimes people find it really hard. Brian didn't find it hard. Uh, what's your favorite game? Single one of all time. You have to just pick one. Uh, can I pick a, a, a franchise? I, I think Civilization is still my favorite game. So okay. I, I've enjoyed them all. I think Civ 4 might have been a highlight in some ways. Um, uh, but, uh, but nope, I, my, my <laughs> kids and I would play Civilization. I, I, can't, I, can't play, I can't play first person shooters. I just get sick. Like, especially on a wide field of view, I have a bad, big screen and like, I, 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 get, I get ill, I get clammy. Um, so I, I've decided I'm just not a, I get motion sick. So, so like the, the strategy, the, you know, top down strategy games, much more my style. And, uh, I'd have to say the civilization franchise is the one that just, I just keep coming back to. Awesome. You didn't find that tough. Uh, this question is a hit or miss. David, uh, thanks again for the amazing conversation. Before we end the podcast, you're, uh, Dave dot Luke, D-A-V-E dot l-u-e-b-k-a on twitter for anyone you can also find it in the show notes any other platforms where the people from the audience can connect with you nope <laughs> I, 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 twitter is the only one that i use and I've, i i haven't had time to use it very much lately um i feel i feel guilty about that sometimes uh twitter of course is where all the graphics and game developers hang out so like it's it's a it's a professional like imperative to like know what's going on there uh but no feel free to reach out dave.loopke at twitter that's right um and you know i'm easy to find uh online awesome thanks again for your time and for all of your amazing research that's helping us improve games and uh, the world of graphics in general uh, i really enjoyed the interview thank you for having me <laughs>